Well, okay, today uh, we're taking a break from our Belief series. Uh, it's, uh, again, uh, just as a heads up, uh, you know, guys, it's Tuesday, it's Valentine's Day, just, you're getting a 48-hour warning, okay? That's, I can't do anything else to help you out now. Um, we uh, started the service today with that uh, a very popular song. I really didn't know. All, uh, I, I'm trying to stay up with all the new artists, but R Rachel Platten, uh, she's known for her fight, fight song and also this song, I'm Going to Stand By You. Uh, again, it's amazing. She has like a quarter of a million hits at least on, on this song. Uh, actually, a quarter of a, quarter of a billion, actually. 256 million, I think. Which, by the way, last week, I just want to apologize. I was getting my six figures and seven figures all mixed up. I, it, was, it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, not over a million. So, again, I have to, like, correct myself when I, I'm not a great accountant. I'm sure that just makes all the accountants in here feel really good about our finances. Anyway, <laughs> oh, the giving's great. We're in the five-figure zone. We had $400 less. Anyway, um, anyway, I digress. Let's get back to the marriage thing. Um, but, but I, I love that song. If you came in at the beginning of the service, we were playing this song because our theme today, as we talk about marriage, uh, is uh, about persevering in marriage. Uh, I, I love some of the lines in her song. It's like, uh, you know, I want to know, love, that you're not alone. Uh, I'm going to stand by you. E I love this line. Even if we're breaking down, uh, we'll find a way to break through. I mean, it, it's so noble, you know, and I could see probably that there are many young couples. I mean, who knows? My daughter's getting married this summer. I'm still getting counseling for that. Um, and, and uh, you know, maybe she's going to choose this as one of her songs to play before the, before the ceremony, you know. It's, it's all filled with hope and joy. You know, we're going in strong. We're going to make it. Yeah, we're going to stand by you, you know. And then, and then we, get, we get into marriage. Um, so as we were trying to put together just to get ourselves into the marriage framework here, um, we actually came across this uh, YouTube channel called Modern Marriage Moments. Modern Marriage Moments. And it's a young couple uh, that uh, sort of depict everyday marriage situations, and they say slightly exaggerated. So they have a lot of fun um, with this. So we're just going to play a few of them just, just to get our heads into the the, the reality of marriage, okay? So we go from Rachel Platten singing this powerful song to, well, let's watch the first one. It's called Grocery Shopping. Okay, we got another one, and this is one that says, well, actually, this is when husband is asked a certain question, and these are things you should never say. Okay, so those are the um, challenges of marriage, the modern day moments. You know, it's, it's the challenge with marriage, right, is that you go from the high of falling in love, which I think is how God designed it, intended it. Uh, it almost sweeps you up at certain points involuntarily, but... As you move into marriage, you go from being, you know, falling in love to learning how to truly love for the long haul. And there really is a, a difference, right? Where love now has to become a deliberate choice. And, and as much as that doesn't sound as nearly as exciting as uh, all, the, all the love songs that are produced by the singers of the day... There's something actually far more rooted and grounded and real when you can learn to truly love well by choosing to love every day despite all of the, the mundane, the ups and the downs, all the misunderstandings and the crazies that go on in relationships. Uh, actually, I'll, let's just go to the slide where we want to highlight the verse today. It's in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. It's actually written at it's the beginning of chapter 14, but... Uh, when you read the New Testament letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the chapter before, chapter 13, is what is known as the great love chapter. If you haven't read the, that chapter recently, you know, it's good to review. 
Uh, Paul, Paul there talks about saying that, you know, you can do all these great things. You can have all the knowledge of the world. You can speak all the languages of the world. You can sacrifice yourself to the world. You can do all these great things. But if you don't have love, you actually have nothing. And then he goes on and says, you know, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Love endures all things. Love never gives up. I mean, he gives this great poetic statement about love. And then he even goes on and says in chapter 13, you know, these th three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. Oh, aren't those great words about faith and living? But then he says, but the greatest of these, as great as faith is, as great as hope is, the greatest of all is love. And, and, and actually, some commentators say that they should have taken this very next sentence that starts chapter 14 and should have actually added it at the end of chapter 13, if you're dividing it up. Because then he ends by saying this whole thing on love. This is what he says. So because of all this, what I've said, everything about love, now let love be your highest goal. Well, you know, what's your highest goal in life? You know, security, uh, popularity. Well, well, the Bible's saying your highest goal in life, make it love. Make it a love that's rooted in, in the love of God, but make it love. Um, just by the way, just to connect the dots, hence our vision statement for our church, great souls make the journey to what? Love like Jesus. See, we think you're going to be a great soul when you make love your highest goal, right? You know, as we think, think about this today, I, I was thinking, though, that uh, ironically, one of the best places... Uh, for us to learn how to love well, to learn this ability to deliberately choose to love well is actually in the context of marriage. Can you learn it in other relationships? Absolutely. And I just want to say as a sort of as a, as a rejoinder here to some, some of you are saying, well, I'm not married, or I was married, or, you know, you're in that zone where you're saying, I don't really want to get married right now, and, you know, all those reasons. But, but what we want to do is recognize that marriage is one of those fundamental institutions that God did instill right at the beginning of creation and that we're saying well we know that this is a common path for so many so how do we do it well well today i want to talk about the five ways of love just going to keep it really simple for you what are the five ways of love to make your marriage last to, to sort of go the distance okay here are the five ways. And what I want you to do is do your own review and say, yep, okay, number one, I'm doing pretty good. Two, well, three, ooh, four, okay, five, ah, uh, okay. I mean, you decide where, which one you want to kind of zero in on. So let's start. Number one, show affection. Show affection. Uh, it, it's interesting that, that um, we, we sometimes think about when a couple falls in love, that they get to become what we say one flesh, as it says in Genesis chapter 2. And there's this whole idea that uh, a man and a woman enjoy what we call eros love, uh, this deep physical intimacy. And that is a part of marriage. That's a in critical part of marriage. But like I always want to say to all the husbands, the best sex in marriage starts in the kitchen. Okay, did you get that, guys? The best sex in marriage starts in the kitchen. You've got to show affection from all aspects of your life. Let's just talk a little bit about affection really quick. Um, this sounds almost clinical, but I'll just go through them. So, again, because some people go, what do you mean by affection? Okay, well, here we go. Um, eye contact. Look at the other person in the eyes. Um, caresses. Uh, sitting closely together. Holding hands. Um, love can be expressed creatively through, um, you know, making situations where you're spending time, uh, you know, focusing on each other. For example, do a walk together. Um, sit b before a fireplace together. Uh, do a scenic drive. Do a picnic. Okay? These are all expressions of affection. Um, playing together. Uh, having fun together uh, are also expressions of affection. Um, Verbal uh, expressions of affection, you know, of course you can say, I love you, but, but learn to say I love you in fresh, creative ways. You know, I really enjoy it when, you know, you uh, wear that outfit, and, and we, I know we're going to go and have some fun right now. Or, uh, you know, I, I like it when we all sit down and have that coffee and cupcake together. It's just, it's just kind of neat and fun. I mean, you got to express affection in fresh ways. Um, 
praise the strengths of your partner. Say, you know, you're so creative. I, I, I like the way, you know, you, you put together that living room and uh, you've really put some thought in it. You know, it's just so neat the way this meal looks. Or, hey, it's just so neat the way you built that deck out there. Or whatever. On and on the list goes. Um, expressions. Here's the thing. Look for opportunities throughout the year to also express affection. That's why special days like Valentine's Day, yes, it's a man-made holiday. Yes, for some of you cynics, it's just the card company trying to make more money selling cards. But it's an opportunity to express affection towards one another. And again, this is where buying not an expensive gift, but a considerate, meaningful gift uh, means so much. Just as a hint, again, I almost feel like I'm talking to the men here more because I'm a guy and i got to tell myself all this stuff, is that, um, you know, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, your wife doesn't really want the most expensive gift from you. And some of you women are going, what do you mean? If you want to give me an expensive gift, Dave, like, let's not cut the, let's not cut the flow here. But um, I think what they're really looking for, if I could say it in a general way, is that if they think that you took time took time to think about them and to go and find something meaningful, they would say, that person, that husband of mine took time to think about me, and that's an expression of affection, you see? So even, the, the, so even how you buy the gift, believe it or not, all plays into it. Um, okay, those, that, that's affection. So show affection, okay? Number one. Number two, be friends. <laughs> Shock. Be friends. Um, you know, friendship love can be cultivated by spending quality time together. Notice I use the word quality time. It isn't just sitting together like two rocks next to each other on a beach. It's actually spending quality time. Um, you know what friends do for each other? Friends spend time doing what the other friend enjoys doing. That means that maybe it is if, if it's watching a football game together, whether or not you both love the football game. That means you garden together, even though one really has got the green thumb and the other one's all, nothing but left thumbs about it. Um, friends spend time together. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely um, convinced that one of the dangers of our technology today, I, I saw this interesting uh, <laughs> a video, uh, not video, a picture just last week. Um, there was this picture of this family in the 1950s, and it was just when the television was coming out, so the old black and white, and it showed this family all gathered around watching, you know, whether it was the Ed Sullivan show or some show back then, right? Then it showed a modern-day 2016 picture of a family sitting in their living room, and guess what they're all doing? The, the TV's on, but everyone has their own tablet, and they're all watching their own thing. And, and I think the danger is that we've got to be careful as we, um, we, we can be in the same room, but be a million miles apart. And, and one of the dangers, and, and I'm going to go for this right now. I might as well bring up this point since it's on my, my mind. The real danger is that we, we, we know the divorce rates that happen in, in, in marriages across our country. But I'm convinced that there are more couples that are, now hear me clearly, emotionally divorced right now, and, and they're still legally married, but they're emotionally divorced. There's no friendship. They, they, they kind of, you know, they, they pass each other. They, they manage the house together. They ma and, and here's the thing. Children have a great way of covering up that emotional divorce taking place because you're busy taking care of the kids. You're busy involved in the kid's life. And don't get me wrong. Family is absolutely critical. But, but here's the danger. Family can be the emotional replacement for the friendship that you should be cultivating as a husband and wife. Because someday, newsflash, I'm 56 now, I can tell you this, believe it or not, these wonderful kids you love to death grow up and they leave you. And then they decide to get married and move far, far away. So much for loyalty. <laughs> Look, I really am getting counseling for this, so we'll just... <laughs> but the point is, after the kids leave 
And and if that has been your main emotional draw in your family, and then all of a sudden, you're two, instead of two good friends in the house together, there are two what? Strangers. So, so, Friend, so you work at your friendship because think about the friends you have in your other life. I know this for me to maintain my friendship with certain people in this church at all these various levels, guess what I have to do? I have to take time. I schedule. If I haven't heard from them recently, I say, hey, when are we getting together? Let's do this. Let's do that. We take time with our friends. We can't, we have to be as specific as that with our own spouses. We have to take time to be a friend to each other. Okay? Okay, that's number two. Number three. Now remember, the background of all this is this. We want to make what? Love our highest goal. And if we're going to express love, we're first of all going to show affection, and secondly, we're going to be friends. Number three, we're going to serve the other. We're going to serve the other. You know, we talk about um, love languages, and, um, you know, there's the, 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 the language of giving time with each other. There's the language of touch. Uh, there's the language of gift giving. There's the language of affirmation. But here's the one I have found that has been the common language for almost every marriage. Because they say usually your spouse has two love languages. Okay? So I remember the first four I mentioned there, right? Touch, time, talk, gifts of, uh, you know, gifts. But guess one that I find is a bottom line one for all marriages. It's the language of service. It's the language of helping out the other person. And, and I can't stress this enough. You have to be willing to serve one another. That means for, I'll look at the young families here. That means you share the, 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 the diaper side of the babies, right? You don't say, I mean, I grew up in a home, and this just shows you the change in, change in culture, right? I grew up in a time where, you know, my father said, I, I don't know how to change a diaper. I mean, that's, that's for the woman. And some guys... <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. So the point is, that's what my father said. So, so the, the thing is, is that, now I think he obviously grew in, a, in his understanding over the years. I want to be fair to him, recognizing that I'm being taped here, and he's probably going to watch this and call me up about it. Um, so, Dad, hey, I don't want to misquote you here. I'm just saying, I think, you know, Mom did most of the diaper changing. Let's just be honest, okay? I'm having a little conversation here right now. It's getting really weird for me. Okay, so the point is, um, uh, you know, it, it, but it's being willing to serve. And, and, and here's, and, and I just want to stress something here about serving. Real serving is this. It isn't you walking in saying, well, I know where I'm going to help you because this is where I'm really strong at. Real servanthood says, where do you need help? How can I help you? And then you zip the lips and you listen. Rather than saying, here's how I'm going to help you because I'm so talented in this area. No, you say, how can I help you? And if, the, if your spouse says, well, you know, I just would love to have you show up for this event. Really? Y- yeah. Really? Y- yeah, I want you to. That, that, you know, okay, you serve with your time. Maybe it's, can, can you clean up the kitchen before you leave? Oh, okay, I'll do that. Um, man, I'm really behind on the laundry. Can you, can you help out with the laundry? Yeah, okay, I can do that. Um, yeah, on and on it goes. Or I really need some help in the budgeting right now. I'm getting behind. I'm putting all the receipts in, and I'm falling behind in our budgeting for the month. Okay, I can help you with that. The point is, you take time to ask the service question. Um, can, can I be honest with you that one of the greatest expressions of serving is the willingness to change? Listen to this. Listen to this loudly. Um, that when you serve your spouse, you are saying, I'm, I want to make a commitment to change attitudes and behaviors in myself that trouble, bother, or frustrate you. Because if your spouse says, you know, you're always doing this, and it just frustrates me, one way you can serve that spouse is to say, okay, you know what, can, 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 can I start moving in a new direction there? Okay? So, um, uh, and, and, and can I tell you, too, that one way you can serve your spouse, too, spiritually, is to say, how can I pray for you? To say, can I pray for you today? That's a, another act of service. All right, let's, tie, let's go to number four. Um, it's tie truth and trust together. I, I just want to say this very quickly. Uh, I, I think that often for us, truth is a weapon that we use. Let's be honest. When we're in conversation with our spouse, if we finally say, do you really want to know the truth? 
Do you think that the spouse is expecting good news in the next few sentences? We often treat truth as a weapon and we'll let fly some real harsh, sometimes insulting remarks and harsh words. And the next thing we know, there's nothing left to our spouse but smoking shoes or sneakers coming out of them. So you know what we then do? When we realize the power of speaking the truth in such a raw way, you know which way we then swing? We just say, I'll never bring up any negative truth or any corrective truth. I'll never will do it. So we just do nothing but affirmation. How are things going? Great. How do I look in this? Fantastic. How are things going in our marriage? Oh, just glory time all the time. And you know what happens there? It's the moment we refuse to speak truth, but only speak, in a sense, what we call affirmation, is we deny our spouse the opportunity to grow. We deny our spouse the opportunity to deal with issues. So if we think the most loving thing to do is to simply shut up, stuff it, and hide it, what we really think and feel, well, that is maybe rooted in love, but we sacrifice truth in the midst of it. Now, the Bible says we're called to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. And how do we do that? Well, that's where we have to build trust into our marriage where we say, when I speak to you, I want you to know that I have your absolute back here on this, that I'm in your corner, that I love you, that I want to affirm you. You know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that in the Bible, when it talks about forgiving one another when we're hurt, Jesus says this, if you're praying and you realize you have someone, something against someone, in this case, think about your spouse, you must forgive him or the, her right there. But then does that mean you should not confront that person? Well, the Bible goes on and actually says in Matthew 18, and Paul says in Galatians 6, it says you should point out where that fellow Christian or that fellow person is in wrong and help move them to a place that is right and good. See, the Bible says we're supposed to forgive and then go confront. And for most of us, though, we think confronting is all about getting revenge. Well, I'm going to confront you. I'm going to tell you what I really think. But that's not how the Bible describes confrontation. It's done in the context of forgiveness. Um, because if you decide to confront out of revenge, I guarantee you what your result will be. You will have a destroyed marriage. But if you confront in the context, and listen carefully, in the context of seeking the truth and seeking to build one another up and to restore and redeem one another, then there's hope. Well, that's, that brings us to the final way. You've got to forgive each other. You have to forgive each other. You know, the basic story of the gospel is this, right? That God does not love us because of our loveliness. He loved us when we were at our worst. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The, the Bible constantly tells this story of what we, call, what we call the gospel or the good news. Is that Jesus laid down his life for us so that we who are ugly in our sin could be made beautiful because of his act of sacrificial love and forgiveness. Now, I want you to connect the dots. The Bible says that husbands love your lo wife as Christ loves the church. That kind of sacrificial love is what is supposed to shape our marriages. You see, you may feel your spouse is crucifying you, but never forget that your sins really did put Jesus on the cross, and the one thing he did was he forgave you. And that needs to be your overriding metaphor. You know, I, I'm almost tempted now, from now on, that anytime we do a wedding, I want to have a big cross right here behind and before the couple. Why? Because I'm going to say that has got to be the main metaphor for your marriage. Has to be. Because the truth is this marriage has a way of pulling back all the layers, there's no hiding. Our brokenness is there. 
our, our self-centeredness is there. Let's be honest, a lot of times we fall in love and we start off in our marriage thinking about how much that person, now listen to this, how much that person completes me and it's going to make me happy and it's going to make me feel wonderful and I'm so glad I'm getting married to this wonderful person because this person's going to make me look so good. Do you notice the problem with that, that, all those sentences? A lot of young couples that get married are really self-centered. And then they have to deal with that self-centeredness. And the truth is, is that as couples age, that either then they can't, they can't handle the fact that they really do need to change themselves. They really got to become selfless and sacrificial to, in order to keep loving. And they don't want to do it. So they get emotionally divorced. They start separating. And then finally they just go their separate ways because they don't really want to really love at that what we call deep level. See, we've got to allow that metaphor, what God did for us what, in Christ, to change us. You know, that means we'll never ha- we can never play fair. When you can say, well, she did this to me. You're not expecting me to go the second. Yeah. She, he did that to me. You're not expecting me to turn the other. Uh, yeah. Well, how many times are you expecting me to forgive her? Well, Jesus talked 70 times. Yeah. See, it's all under the shadow of the cross that we find the power to forgive. Let me just read this statement by Tim Keller. He says, I do not know of any more powerful resource for granting forgiveness than this, and I don't know of anything more necessary in marriage. Do you hear this? More necessary in marriage than the ability, listen, to forgive fully, freely, in an unpunishingly way from the heart. A deep, only when you and I experience a deep experience of the grace, mercy, and forgiveness of God ourselves, where you finally come to grip of how deep sin is in your life and how you have been saved only by grace, only by grace, will that enable the power of truth and love to work together in your marriage. It isn't only until you have a deep experience of God's forgiveness in your own life that you'll find the fuel to be able to continue to forgive your spouse, as you tie truth and trust then together, and as you show affection, and as you serve one another, and as you do all the other ways of love. I want to just end this message today on a little Greek word study, just for a moment. I I just thought, why not teach you some Greek words, okay? Only one Greek word. Here we go. In that verse, make love your highest goal, if you were reading the actual Greek that Paul wrote that in, the Koine Greek at the time, it would have been, I won't read the whole, say the whole sentence in Greek for you, but it's make agape your highest goal. Make agape your highest goal. Now, actually, the Greeks had something on us when it came to the word love. They had different words for the word love. They had actually four core words, sturge, eros, philio, and agape. Now, here's the thing. In our English language, the problem is we use love for everything. So, you know, we could have someone here turn after this message and say, oh, Pastor Dave, I just love the way he preaches. And that just reminds me how much I love you. And you know what? Let's go and have pizza because I really love pizza. And you see the problem? We've gone from all sort of different expressions with one word, love. Now, here's the thing. In the Greek, sturge meant basically familial love. Like, if you're part of the family, I love you, you love me, we're all, we're all more houses. Great. Um, eros love, that's, that's erotic love. That's, you know, physical love, intimacy, that type of love. Filial love is friendship love. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, okay? Agape love is a love that the New Testament used to describe God's love for us. A love that was deep, filled with mercy, and it's unconditional, and it never ends. And Paul says, that's the kind of love you need for one another. And that's why we say agape love. Now, don't get me wrong. All the other kind of loves are actually important. I'm not saying get rid of them. You need eros love. You need filial love. You need sturge love. But what you need at the base of it all is agape love, an unconditional, full of mercy kind of love. Well, in this moment, we're going to end the message, and um, I, I actually was thinking about a, a song that I've heard in weddings. It's by Stephen Curtis Chapman, 
And uh, it's been a song I've heard over the years, and it's entitled, I Will Be Here. Um, let me just read you some of the lyrics. Uh, Tomorrow morning, if you wake up and the sun does not appear, I will be here. If in the dark we lose sight of love, hold my hand and have no fear, because I will be here. I'll be true to the promise I've made you, to you and to the one who gave you to me. And just as sure as the seasons are made for change and our lifetimes are made for years, so I, I will be here. We'll be together and I'll be here. You know, again, I recognize that there's a whole bunch of marriages here before me today. And in our Journey Church, we have lots of marriages. And, and I'm realistic. We're all broken people. And maybe for some of you, your marriages are maybe in a zone or in a season that you're saying we're in a deep valley, Dave. For others of you, you may be just starting off fresh and new, and you're saying, Dave, I'm feeling great. Everything's great. It's fantastic. For others of you, you've journeyed over decades together. Decades. And... You're just saying, you know, well, Lord, what do you have in store for us in the years to come? So today I want to just suggest that we do something. Um, when, I, when I'm doing a wedding rehearsal, I always go over the vows. And the only thing I ask the couple to say is after I say the vow, then you look at your partner and say, I do. Well, today I want to sort of do a sort of a renewal of vows. And again, may, maybe your spouse is with you here today, maybe not. Uh, Maybe they're downstairs working in the children's ministry right now. Um, But I want to encourage you to do something. I'm going to say, I wrote up a little, I wrote these up uh, just actually yesterday, uh, a little vow. And what I want you to do is, if you're sitting next to your spouse, I want you to turn to that person afterwards and just repeat after me and say, I still do. I still do. And uh, if your partner's not with you, then in your heart, make it a prayer and say, I still do. Okay? So here's, here's, the, here's the vows. I'm going to stand by you. I want to grow old with you. I want to be there for you, enjoying everything you do, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. I want love to be the highest goal in our marriage, centered on God's love and Christ's sacrificial love to us. This is my promise. And if you agree, look at your partner and say, I still do. Let's pray. Lord, um, we just... uh, ask that you would fill us with a deep, rich sense of your love for us. And Lord, that we would make love our highest goal. That every action, every word that comes out of our mouth. And Lord, we know that when we fail, we're going to run to your love and your mercy, and we're going to continue on. And so Lord, I would pray that that very love gets embedded into every marriage here today. Lord, for the marriages that are in valleys, for the marriages that are in hilltops, for the marriages that are just on the plains of life that seems just pretty straightforward. But Lord, today, help us to learn to love well, to show affection, to be friends, to serve another, each other, to, to speak the truth, to, to put it together with trust, and Lord, most of all, to forgive. And Lord, I pray that as, as the, your love goes into these marriages, that in the days to come, um, families will be blessed, lives will be changed. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen.